As soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then Jesus told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of the Decapolis. There, some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After Jesus took him aside, away from the crowd, he put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said, Aphtha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. I'd like to invite you before I say anything more to turn to somebody near you and speak a word or a phrase that stayed with you from that gospel. It's not a test. <laughs> it's, it's a way to begin our conversation today of how we hear the proclaimed word of God. What kind of Christ is Jesus? You know, the, this uh, question is provocative, but it's really kind of put in front of us by St. Mark himself. At the beginning of his gospel, he says, the good news of Jesus the Christ, Son of God. And then he spends the rest of his gospel proclaiming the good news of who Jesus the Christ is. What kind of Christ is Jesus? Remember, Christ means the anointed one. We are called Christians. We are anointed as Jesus was anointed in the spirit of God, in the mission of of God. And so what was this mission? What was this message Jesus proclaimed as the anointed one in first century Palestine? So we're invited by Mark, I think, to engage our religious imaginations. This isn't about being right or wrong. Mark uses a very little detail in his stories. He tends to be pretty vague, which in it seems to me as an invitation for us to engage the story, to ask ourselves, what did I hear? How am I in this story? What's it saying to me today? Put yourself in the story. So today, I just want to make a few suggestions to you of how perhaps you can hear the story or how it's resonating with me in particular and uh, putting that out in front of you to ponder a little bit about how it's resonating for you. I like to listen to these stories, these two stories in particular from St. Mark, because I think they are two of the most significant here towards the middle of the gospel. If we look at them in the shadow of what we heard last week, 
We remember last week was this encounter with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Remember, Jesus is up in the Galilee region, up in the northern part of Israel. He's preaching and teaching and healing, and he's got crowds that are following him. And the leaders are threatened by him, and they're starting to follow him to hear what he's doing, to see what he's doing, and to try to trip him up, to dishonor him. And last week we heard them confronting Jesus' disciples. Why don't you wash your hands? Why don't you keep the tradition, the great tradition of our elders, of our fathers? Why don't you live like us? Why don't you look like us holding the law of our elders? And Jesus responds to them and calls them hypocrites because he's defending his followers, the peasants, the people who are close to the land, the humble people who don't have running water available to all day. They don't have the privilege and the wealth of the Pharisees and the leaders and the teachers of the law. He says, you use these laws to separate us, to point out how people are failing, how people are falling short. Instead of using them to bind us, to call us together, to be compassionate with people, you are hypocrites. You claim to serve God, but you're serving yourselves. You're serving your interpretation of the law. You don't even know my people. You're hypocrites. You're actors. You're pretenders. And so after this encounter from last week, Jesus says to his disciples, I want to go away. I need to go away. And he suggests to them that they go up to the land of Tyre and Sidon, which is in Gentile territory. It would be like walking from Anamosa up to, uh, let's say, uh, Ryan. It's up in that area, Prairie Burg, somewhere up in there, okay? But on the way, you have to cross a sort of an invisible boundary between the Jews and the Gentiles. These are two populations of people who have lived for generations as enemies, labeling each other, hating each other, saying the other is outside of God's favor and outside of God's realm. The Jews resisted any interaction with Gentiles because they believed and made them unclean. They were the unbelievers after all. And Jesus suggests to his disciples, hey, let's get away for a few days. Let's head up to the land of the Gentiles. Why? What's he doing? Well, it suggests in the story that he wanted to kind of disappear for a little while. Maybe he was tired. Maybe he wanted a little retreat. He didn't want to be recognized. Or maybe he had something else going on. Maybe he wanted to take his disciples up into the Gentile territory to teach them something more about this kingdom that he was proclaiming. Maybe he wanted to learn something more about this kingdom for himself as he figured out what it means to be Messiah, what it means to be the Christ. How was he called to reveal the message of God's kingdom? Could it really be to more than just the Jews? So he make the trek up to Tyre, up towards the Mediterranean coast, and he gets into the village and he no more gets there than this woman recognizes him. And she runs up to him and does something that none of the Jewish leaders have been doing in the past. She runs up to him and throws herself to the ground in front of him. She goes low and shows humility before him. And this is shocking because she's breaking all the cultural boundaries. She approaches a Jewish man unaccompanied by a male. She didn't have her father or her husband or her eldest son with her. She was not supposed to approach a man. And yet she does. Why? She is motivated by a need that is so deep, it goes beyond her to the next generation. She goes to him with a need to have her daughter, an unnamed daughter, the next generation, freed from an impure spirit, freed from a demon. And the way she does it is she goes low, close to the ground, close to the earth, humus, which is also the root word for humility. She shows humility before Jesus. 
which is the, is the contradiction to hypocrisy. She was authentic before Jesus, even though she was a descendant of Queen Jezebel, that queen who was against the Jews a thousand years earlier, who had called her priests of Baal to confront Elijah and the worshipers of Yahweh. She was the one who had, who had threatened Elijah's life. She was the one who had divided the peoples. This woman was a descendant of hers eons of enemies and here she is on the ground before Jesus saying Lord I know who you are I know you have the power of God heal my daughter and Jesus at least surprisingly to me responds to her the way Jews would have responded to a Gentile for eons you dog do you think you are wanting some of the food that belongs to the children of God? And she doesn't respond out of anger or defensiveness. She looks up at him and says, yes, Lord, I may be a dog, but at least the dogs still enjoy the crumbs that fall from the children's table. And at this point, I imagine Jesus kind of belly laughing. <laughs> You got me with that one. You know what? Your response has freed your daughter from her demon. Jesus doesn't go to their home. He doesn't lay hands on. He doesn't say anything to the daughter. He doesn't breathe on her. He doesn't spit on her. He doesn't even see her. What he acknowledges is the healing comes from the woman's response the woman's humility, the woman's ability to express her need for healing. And the healing happens from this Jewish teacher and rabbi in Christ. What is the demon that left the daughter that day? What is the impure spirit that kept her from being separated from the community? Mark doesn't tell us. Was it, was it anxiety? Was it depression? Was it, did she have some kind of a facial disfigurement? Did, did she lack something? Was she the one that the kids didn't invite to their birthday parties? Did she have a limp? What, what, did she suffer from violence? What was it that kept her locked in her isolation? Perhaps this girl suffered from the poverty that comes from generations of hatred. Perhaps she suffered fear and anxiety from a Jew who she's been told for a thousand years is the enemy, is the one that we avoid. Perhaps she is lost because of the dehumanizing titles and labels they place on each other, the name-calling. Maybe she suffered from the isolation of the name-calling. And in the exchange between her mother and Jesus, healing happens because that is removed. Jesus acknowledges that the mother's faith is worthy of healing, is worthy of acknowledgement, is faith that is greater than even the Jews have. And God's healing power is there. Perhaps reconciliation happened that day between two former enemies. And the daughter, the next generation, was healed because of it. Imagine the stories that they were able to tell around the village that day. This Jewish man and my mother, they, they interacted in a humane way. They lifted each other up. They didn't curse each other. They didn't put each other down. They didn't demonize each other. They were able to dignify each other. And there was healing. Could that have been the way forward from that day for the people of Tyre? You know, I began to think differently about this story after I went on a service trip to Mexico as a college student. We went to Ciudad del, de Juarez, right across the border from El Paso. 
And it was a 10-day service trip, and we were committed to being in the same village all 10 days. And the thing about Juarez, if, if you already know this, is it's about a million people that live there. Half of the city is like a modern American city. Half of it is a dump where people live in intense poverty, in shacks made out of cardboard and tin. They eke out uh, a survival by going and working in the populous side of the city. They come back to this dump each day. And what they had been told, I found out, as we were in the dump that day working in one of the villages, is that they believed that Americans hated them, that their poverty was a result of punishment for their lives, for who they were. And the fact that Americans would come into their village, they were surprised because we didn't come in bearing armloads of clothing and food. We didn't come in ready to share charity with them like they had experienced lots of times before, people dropping stuff off and leaving. No, we went and we stayed with them. And we let them get to know us. And we played soccer with wadded up newspapers. And we brought a Nerf football with us and ta taught them how to play flash football. And we played with the kids. And because we were there that week, healing happened. They learned that not all Americans think that they're trash or that they are deserving of their poverty. They didn't hear us calling them names. They didn't hear us labeling them. And we called them by name. And because of that relationship that developed, there was reconciliation. There was healing. Perhaps that is what happened in Tyre that day. Perhaps that's what happened in lots of places that Jesus visited where formerly there was separation and isolation because of his compassion, because he looked at people and broke those cultural barriers. You know, it follows up with this story that needs attention as well. That Jesus takes his disciples and they go through the Galilee. They don't stay back in the Jewish territory. They go down into the Decapolis, the Roman territories, the cities of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, you know, they recognize Jesus when he comes into their town. They know about his power that he's been exuding. And they bring to him a man who sounds a lot like somebody from Isaiah 35. He's deaf, and he's unable to speak clearly. According to the religious leaders, he's cursed. He's sinned somewhere. His spiritual life, his spiritual energy is blocked. He's not able to know the fullness of God. And when Jesus is presented with this man, even though he's a Gentile, he responds to him the same way he would have responded to a Jew. He doesn't do this in public. He takes him aside. And some of us like to think this was Jesus' spiritual direction session with him. He listens to the man and he takes him and he places his fingers in his ears. And he spits and touches his tongue. And he says, Ephatha, be opened. And the man's ears and mouth are opened to proclaim the goodness of God, to sing the praises of God. And the community is opened to the presence of God in their midst, to the power of healing that is in their midst. They are opened to Jesus' humility because they want to make him king. They want to worship him. They want to treat him like their own folk healer, someone they will come to, to tap into that power, to have him serve them, to have, them, have him lead them. Instead, he says, no, that's not who I am. His humility shows them the response to God's great power. Go low and keep pointing up. It's like making a touchdown. Jesus did not point to himself. He pointed to God and invited people to respond to God's healing power, to reconciliation, to freedom in God by praising God and worshiping God. They said he did all things well. What he did the best was show humility. So if we have any doubt about what the kingdom of God is like that Jesus proclaimed, it is rooted in humility. 
It is close to the earth. And the power of the kingdom comes from being close to the earth. You know, there's some, there's some ideological trends in the United States right now that are very concerning. Strong resurgence of nationalism under the guise of patriotism, racism, xenophobia, fear of the other, fear of the foreigner. It's rampant. We're surrounded by messages of hatred, labeling, entitlement, privilege. But it is not gospel. In fact, that kind of opinion and perspective is contrary to the gospel we hear today. And we as Christians have to make a decision. Do we follow a Jesus of humility? Are we Christians in a kingdom of humility? Are we able, like James, to see the people who come into our midst as equal in the kingdom of God? Because, see, the kingdom does not belong to us. Everyone has a right to the food of God, whether it's at the table of the word or the table of the sacrament. Everyone has access to that food. It is not ours. The table does not belong to us. The meal does not belong to us. But what does belong to us is the privilege to invite people to receive the food of God, to be in the kingdom of God. And that privilege is ours today.